phi dx of arc seek x. So first, a clarification is necessary. What the hell is arc seek? It's amazing how many students don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, see, the thing is this. There's actually two ways of defining it, okay? So there's one way of defining arc sine, arc cos, and arc tan. There's a standard way of doing that. But the reciprocal traits, arc coat, I guess arc coat, there's also a standard way. But arc seek and arc cusk, um, there's two different ways of defining that. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through that argument right now. So first of all, secant looks like this, okay? There's like use, all right? With open like that, okay? Right? Keep in mind, this is one over cos, right? Secant is one over cos, so this is secant, okay? Now, when we actually take the inverse, what we're doing is we're flipping the whole graph. <coughs> so, Secant inverse of x looks like this. We're taking that and we're flipping it in the line y equals x. So we're gonna get stuff that looks like this, okay? Yeah, there we go, okay, yeah. So, so here's the thing. Vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes and the u's become like sideways u's um, and there's a problem. That's not a function, okay? You draw a vertical line, you know, it passes through many points. So what we do is we restrict the domain, right? The same way as we did with arc sine, arc cos, arc tan. We restrict the domain. The convention varies for this function. Some books use this domain, zero to pi over two, okay? And then pi over two to pi. So if we restrict, to that domain there, then all we have is this piece and this piece, okay? Here we have a point, here we have a point, okay? And what happens is we define this being seek inverse of x. Arc seek is not the same thing as seek inverse. Arc seek is that function there, seek inverse, with these pieces deleted, okay? So arc seek looks like this. Like that. And like uh, this. Okay? There we go. There's arc seek. So, what are the problems here? Well, some books don't do this. Some books skip that part and define this, okay, next piece here from pi to three pi over two to be the restriction. And the graph of arc C looks different. It now comes down here, this piece is gone, and then we have that piece. So there's two variations, and that's why sometimes when you look up the formula for the derivative, sometimes you see an absolute value and sometimes you don't see an absolute value. And I remember I was in first year or second year, and I was getting screwed up. I was like, what is the derivative? Sometimes there's an absolute value, and sometimes there's no absolute value. And eventually, I realized that there are two conventions. You can restrict it like this, in which case you get this graph, and I think this is what your textbook does. Your book, okay? The second way, which uh, James Stewart does in his book, is to restrict the domain differently, okay? So in other books, we might define arc seek like this, okay? The graph will look like that, okay? This is a pi. This is one, that's negative one. Okay, pi over two, pi. So, this is James Stewart. and this is your book, okay? What's the better way? I don't know. They both have their ups and downs. This one looks maybe a bit nicer because you don't have this gap, this weird looking gap over here, okay? Of length pi over two. But here's the thing. This function is always increasing, okay? So the derivative 
the derivative over here is 1 over, if I remember correctly, abs x root x squared minus 1. Here, the derivative is different because the function is different. The derivative is 1 over x root x squared minus 1. So this graph has the benefit that you don't get the absolute value, right? Decreasing, increasing. Negative sign when x is negative. Increasing, increasing. No negative sign when x is negative. The abs value kills it. So there are two different formulas. How many of you actually knew this before I said it? Yeah, see that's the thing. I didn't either in first year. You know, nobody really tells you this stuff. You just have to get confused and then eventually maybe figure it out yourself or not. Okay? So let's actually prove the formula. How do we prove the formula? We use the standard method for finding the derivative of an inverse function. Okay? If we want to find the derivative of y equals arc seek x, okay, what we do is we seek both sides. Seek y is equal to x, okay? And now we implicitly differentiate. Now differentiate implicitly. Okay? Differentiate it implicitly, which means what? We take the derivative of both sides, okay? And then remember to put y prime where we see y. So, how do we differentiate c? What's the derivative of c? Big Yes, okay? So, we take, you know, d by dx of both sides, seek y equals, you know, d by dx of x. You know, that side is easy, that's just one. And this side is seek y, tan y, times y prime, and that equals 1, okay? And now we just solve for the y prime. y prime is 1 over seek of y, tan of y, okay? And now what is y? It's arc seek of x. So this is going to be 1 over seek of arc seek x, x, okay? And now, what is tan of arc seek x? Here's the trick. Remember the identity. Um, 1 plus tan squared y equals seek squared. Okay? Tan squared y is root seek squared y minus 1. Seek y is x. Done. Okay? What about the absolute value? Does that come in or does that not come in? Well, it depends on the definition of secant. Seek of arc seek might be x or it might be abs value of x, depending on your restriction. Okay? All right. Any questions about this stuff? Yeah, this is hard and confusing. I know. This stuff with the, the trig functions. The same problem, by the way, comes up with cosecant. Uh, like, you know, if you wanted to find arc cos x, okay? Um, with arc coat, there's a standard way, but I've even seen that sort of jumbled up. There are two graphs of arc coat, which I've seen, okay? One of them looks like this, okay? It's like an arc tan except flip like that. That's a terrible looking graph. It looks like this, okay? Arc coat. And the other one I've seen looks like this. Completely different graph. Okay. Same thing, just a different domain definition. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions about like trig, you know, whatever, getting the derivative of an inverse? Remember, this is the way you do it. Okay. If you don't like the fact that you introduce y and you differentiate implicitly, you could also do it like this. Um, x is equal to seek x uh, seek of arc seek x and then take the derivative of this. So 1 is equal to seek arc seek x tan arc seek x times arc seek x prime. Yeah, I wrote all over the diagram. And then rearrange for arc seek prime by dividing by that. Same effect, OK? Compose the function with its inverse. That equals x by definition. And then take the derivative of the equation you have. 
Okay? Okay. Um, so, anything else? Uh, oh, right, optimization. I'm going to set up an interesting question for you guys. It's going to be a hard one. All right. Here's an optimization question. So, I'm not going to do the standard ones that you see in like high school, right? Like this is a standard optimization question you see in high school. You got a semicircle of some radius r, okay? And you want to inscribe a rectangle. And the question is, what's the maximum area? Okay. That's too easy, right? That's high school. We've moved on. So, high school plus question. We've got two circles. That's actually a really good circle. Okay, we got two circles. Now, I'm going to probably mess up the interval. Uh, yeah, okay, all right, okay. So, two circles. Okay? And here's what I'm going to do I'm going to put the rectangle here. Okay, yeah. Oh. Okay. Cool. So, so there's the rectangle. Now, the radius of this little circle is little r, and the radius of the big circle is big r. And the problem is find max area of rectangle. Okay? It's an actually good math problem. So, take one minute to think about this, please. Don't just wait for me to give you the answer. Take one minute to think about it, and then we'll set it up together. Okay? So try to set that up yourselves. Let's see how good you guys are. Okay? Let's see if you can handle this. If you've seen a question like this in two days, when your exam is your exam on Friday? Yes. On Friday the 13th. Is that some sort of ominous sign? Uh, hopefully not. The first step is the most difficult one. If you mess it up, you'll likely mess up the other steps too. Okay? So, the first step is to set up the question. Set it up. This has two parts. The first part is to get the equation for the thing you want to optimize. And the second part is to get a constraint, okay? You always get those two steps, okay? Two parts. The first part, equation for thing you want to optimize, okay? And the second part is constraint, okay? This thing usually has two variables, okay? So for instance, in this case, we have area. Area is length times width. We have two variables, okay? That's a problem because we want to be able to take a derivative and stuff. We want everything in terms of one variable. That's where the constraint comes in. Okay? The constraint is an equation between our two variables which relates one to the other. We rearrange our constraint for one of the variables and sub it into our equation to get our function. Okay? So the constraint, equation between two variables, okay? and this one usually has at least two variables. Okay? Two plus variables. There might be three. But in the case of three, the constraint would get rid of two of them for you. Okay? <clears throat> Between two plus variables. Okay? Which gets rid of all of them but one. So, two parts. Let's get the equation first. That's the easier part in this question. Okay? In this question, area is length times width. Okay? Uh, there's the width. Okay? Here. There's the width. Uh, I'll put the W like up here. Okay. The width is the whole thing, and the length is like the whole thing. Okay? There we go. Um, so area is length times width. 
That's this part, okay? All right, now what's the constraint? We want something relating length and width because we don't want to have just two variables here, okay? So what's the thing that relates length and width? For this part, we actually look at the diagram and try to figure out how these two must be related so that the rectangle actually is inside these two circles, right? These points have to be on the boundary here, and that point has to be tangent there, okay? How do we get the equation now? How do we figure out what the geometry of this rectangle has to be so that it's lodged in there like that? What do we do? Uh, right, we have two radiuses, ra ra radii? radii? Yeah, radius. radius. No, no, radius. Radiuses. No, radii. Okay, radii. Let's call it by the proper name. Okay, so we're going to start from the center. Okay, I'm going to draw the center over here. Okay, um, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to go off through that point and up here, okay? And then we're going to go across here, and then we're going to go down like that, all right? There it is, a triangle. Who thought of that? Nobody. <laughs> Good luck on the final, guys. All right, um, so this is little r, right? This is L here. This is W over 2, and this is capital R. <laughs> okay, so the constraint is the Pythagorean theorem. R plus W squared plus, oops, L. <clears throat> plus W over 2 squared equals R squared. <clears throat> there we go. There's the constraint, okay? So that's step one. Get the equation, get the constraint. Step two, rearrange the constraint for one of the variables. Rearrange constraint. Okay, which variable do we want to rearrange for, L or W? In this case, L is a bit easier perhaps. You always want to choose the easier one, okay? Um, yeah, W here is easier than L, because L is in, yeah, let's, let's rearrange for W, right? W is what? Move that over, take the square root, multiply by 2. W is 2 root R squared minus R plus L squared. Okay, cool. There's W. And now we're going to take the rearranged constraint and plug it, plug it in there. And we have A as a function of L. Okay, so step number three is define function to optimize. Okay, so we have A and we're replacing out W, so we're going to have everything in terms of L. So I'm going to call this A of L. It's a function of just L, the variable L, okay? And that is going to be 2L root R squared minus R plus L squared, okay? There's our function of L. And now we're almost ready to start the optimizing part. But before we do that, there is a little step here which you'll lose marks for if you don't remember it. So pay attention right now. Step four, domain, okay? We want to figure out where A of L is actually defined, okay? Because if we end up differentiating, getting a critical point, you know, maybe our critical point won't even be in the range that we're looking for. First of all, L has to be greater than zero, okay? Because if L is less than zero, we don't have a rectangle. L has to be greater than zero. And what does L have to be? Well, it has to be so that if you add it in here, you're still within the circle. So L has to be larger than, smaller rather than the big radius minus the little one, okay? So zero is less than L is less than R minus R. And you can confirm the second part yourselves. If you have L equals R minus R, Put that in there, you get R plus capital R minus little r, cancel, cancel, big R squared minus big R squared, get zero, okay? If you plug in anything bigger than this, you get a negative under the root, so the thing's not the plus, okay? So there's the range. This will cost you a mark if you forget it, okay? So remember that. <clears throat> okay, and then step five is to actually optimize. Now, we're not actually gonna do this. You guys can do it if you want the practice, okay? I'm just outlining the steps, okay? 
5, you take the derivative and set it to 0 and solve for, uh, you know, the L which makes that work. Critical L, okay? So solve for the critical point. Get the L, okay? Yeah, I lied. There's more than five steps. Um, step 6, figure out whether the critical point is a minimum or a maximum. In this case, it's pretty obvious that it's going to be a maximum because as L tends to zero, we get a really thin rectangle, um, you know, maybe something lodged in like that, which will tend to zero area. And as L tends to uh, little, or big R minus little r, then we're going to get a really, really skinny rectangle here. So W will have to be zero, okay? Now, you can confirm that by just taking limits, okay? You take the limit as L goes to zero, okay, of your function A of L, and you confirm from the positive side that that's zero, which is the limit as L goes to R minus R from the negative side A of L, okay? The endpoints are zero. Function starts at zero, goes up, ends at zero, okay? The thing that's in the middle, the critical point, therefore, must be a maximum. So that's how you confirm that the critical point is a maximum. This confirms CP above is max, and therefore the answer to our question. Okay? Step seven, therefore, is to actually find the answer. Okay? So now that you found critical L, over here, the, the critical L which makes the derivative zero, you're now gonna take that critical point and see, ah, what is that maximum area at that point? You're gonna take that critical L and plug it back into the function A of L. You're gonna plug in that critical L in here and get out the value. And the value is gonna be something in terms of capital R and little r, okay? And that's gonna be your answer for maximum area. You know it's maximum by step six, okay? Found critical L, sub into a function, okay, and the output of a function is your answer, okay? Um, get your answer, it'll be in terms of the two radii, um, and usually if you have a question like this, uh, maybe it'll say, you know, on the exam, that little r is one and big r is two, in which case, you know, you'd start with one and two, and you'd have an actual number for your special, uh, for your answer. Yeah. You know how you hold the domain for L is between zero and R minus R? Yeah. And uh, do you want for me to write the domain of W? Or? Uh, no. No, because um, your function is only now in terms of L. Like, if, if we rearrange for the other variable here, yeah, you could do the restrictions up over here if you wanted to. Um, but you don't have to, because once your function is in terms of L, L is all we care about. W is determined, if you know L, by the constraint. So you don't need to worry about W at all. It covers the case, right? The case of L is zero is the case of W is like maxed out, okay? And the case of W is zero is the case that L is maxed out or is R minus R. That's okay? Is time up already? Oh, we were having so much fun. <laughs> were you guys having fun? Yeah. I think a while is having fun. All right. Um, yeah, so good luck on the exam, guys. <laughs>